All right, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are there. You're not silent. But by your word, you brought all things into being. And by your word, we know the redemption we have through the word who became flesh, Jesus, your son. And Lord, we thank you that you have revealed to us supremely in him, but in your word written, the story. We thank you for this privilege we have uh, to study it together and to see Israel's part in that amazing story that you have written in eternity. We ask in Jesus' name that you bless our time together, that we our hearts would be uh, touched and our minds instructed, that we might follow more closely in our walk with you and bear witness uh, to your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so a little quick review in this uh, class, The Restoration of Israel. Um, of course, first we had to deal with, well, how did she come to be in the first place? And so we've been talking about the covenants. Of course, the covenants also bear within them uh, the um, revelation that, of course, the Lord is going to restore them if indeed they have been set, seemingly set aside because his covenants um, are unilateral. They're unconditional. He's the one that has called the covenant into being and establish them for his purposes. Um, and so uh, he will fulfill it. And that's, of course, very critical for us as well. Part what I would contend is <clears throat> that if we believe that the Lord has rejected the chosen people, right? Isn't that what the Jews are often referred to? Why are they referred to as the chosen people? Because it's very clear that God chose them. And I know, kind of makes sense, doesn't it? But uh, it's, I have a, a way with the obvious, but, but we often overlook the obvious. He called them, and then throughout the Old Testament, he speaks of them as chosen. And that's what we covered last week. Uh, that's kind of the ramifications of what those um, covenants were about, is he called them, he said he was going to accomplish his purposes in them, uh, and, and then he reiterated over and over that he'd actually, they were his elect. They were his treasured possession. They were his chosen. <clears throat> and so some, regrettably, have argued that because of their sin in rejecting their Messiah, that God is done with them. And I will say to you, they are definitely under discipline. But you know, it's not like that was the first time they'd sinned. Uh, <clears throat> they had sinned before. And the Lord had warned them if they had broken uh, the Mosaic Covenant, uh, which was the standards by which they were to live in the land, that they would be ejected from the land. When they rejected their Messiah, they were, again, ejected from the land. Um, that, nevertheless, does not mean that God is not going to fulfill his promises. He's not going to keep his covenant. And that's very critical for us as <clears throat> followers of Jesus. Because the contention in much of the church, and there's members of the church who disagree with this, I think, contrary to what Scripture clearly declares, which is, we who are in Christ Jesus, ourselves are elect. We are chosen. So what I will contend with you is that if God has rejected the chosen people, then indeed the church neither is secure because he could do the same with us. That itself, however, runs contrary to Scripture and what elect means and the character of God. That's probably the thing that fires me up the most as I feel that such a position, namely saying that God is done with Israel and he could be done with us, uh, it removes it from grace, it removes it from his sovereignty, and it removes it from uh, his truthful and faithful character. God's character 
his reputation, if you will, is at stake in this. And over and over in Scripture, he says, this is not because you're worthy, but it is for my name's sake. All right. So we continue then with then the election of the church. And I want that to be very clear to us because of the relationship between um, what God has done with Israel and what he's done with us as his church. So if you have your Bibles, which I pray you do, or your phones to look things up quickly, we're going to be in the New Testament today. And we're going to start in the Gospel of John. John chapter 15. We'll see right off the bat Jesus' emphasis on the choosing of the apostles. So verse 16 of chapter 15. Jesus said, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the Lord the world hates you. Okay, so the emphasis here is on Jesus choosing them. And of course, as we'll see as we go further into the New Testament, uh, <clears throat> that that choosing is actually something that is rooted in God's eternal plan and purposes. God actually knew he was going to choose those 12 before the world was formed. That's part of the doctrine of God's omniscience, and his sovereignty. He knows it all ahead of time. The whole plan. And that's mind-boggling for finite minds. Uh, but that's the kind, actually, of God you want, isn't it? <laughs> Who's infinite. He's not limited like we are. <clears throat> and so, we have this emphasis from the get-go. As he calls his disciples, he says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And that's deeper than what one might believe on the surface, as we see unfold here in the rest of the New Testament. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians 1. And so basically we're turning to the right. <laughs> going to keep it easy that way. 1 Corinthians is going to be chapter 1. And we'll start with verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Nor many were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And there's part of the point. He's chosen us. We, ha we can't take any credit for it. Oh, well, I'm the one. I, I realize how great God was, and so I chose him. You know? Uh, <clears throat> nope. Um, the fact that you even recognize how great he is is tied in with his election, his choosing of you. And that's an amazing truth from Scripture, that even our faith, even our turning to him in faith, the working of the Holy Spirit is evident there. And I think that'll come clear here more. So let's continue going to the right. We'll go to Ephesians. Okay, remember, there's 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, that's Gentiles eat. Um, Pork chops, remember that? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. So we're in Ephesians. Chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places 
even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. And on he goes. I mean, it's just a powerful verse. Of course, that word um, predestined is also tied in with that. And that's a tough word for a lot of people. And I'm just saying, it's what the book says. Um, one of our issues as human beings, and that's reflected in today's uh, scripture readings, is we have a problem with pride. Hmm. And in our pride, we think somehow we should have it all figured out. It's nice to have it figured out, but we don't. We don't have enough knowledge, let alone the capacity to know it all. Um, and so when we want to say, well, predestination can't be. It's a, uh, 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 uh. You can't say that, you know, just because you, you have choice. You don't know how all that works together. That's one of his great mysteries. There's a security in knowing that he's chosen you, he's elected you, he's predestined you. There's a security in that. Um, unless you believe God makes mistakes. And if you do, then you've got another issue. Okay? But he chose you. He elected you, he predestined you on purpose. And there's a lot about that that's beyond our comprehension. Um, but it's true. It's also true that we choose as well. But again, that's his work in us uh, to choose him. But experientially, I know. I choose you, Lord. But, but he chose me first. But I do, I do experience that and choose him. And that's part of what Scripture says as well. In fact, we're held responsible to choose, aren't we? So how does this work? I don't know. What I can tell you is that God is true. He knows it all. He sees it all. But also, he's left us some hints in physics, for instance. Uh, light has particle, uh, particles and waves. Those are two things that, according to physicists, can't be at the same time. And yet they are. Explain this to me. There's a lot of things. The deeper we go into science and physics, the more we realize we don't know. We don't get it. But it is. Okay? So that's what's called an antinomy. Uh, it's really anti-nomos. Contrary to law. Against law. You know, it seems to be a contradiction. And yet it's true. So also... It seems to be a contradiction that we're responsible to choose, and yet God has chosen us. Hmm. But it's true. And there's a security in that for us, of course, knowing, because we know the Lord doesn't make mistakes. And that uh, helps assure us in our having chosen him that he was involved in that. So praise the Lord. Okay. So even as he chose us in him, meaning in the Lord, before the foundation of the world. So before the world was created. So the fall and all the mess that came with that did not catch God by surprise. That's really important to get. Then he couldn't wonder, but with all the mess, why'd you do it, Lord? <laughs> <laughs> well, because he loves. And love calls others, you know, brings into relationship. Okay? But to be have a real love experience, then choice is involved, right? Um, a robot is not going to love me. Just sorry. It's going to be, you know, set up to operate that way. Um, you're not a robot. You're going to choose whether to love me or not. That's your, you know, your part to play in that. And so we choose whether to love God or not. And so people who don't love God, that's their choice going on there. People who don't seek after him. Because he says, seek and you will find. The reality is a lot of human beings don't want to love God. Though he loves them. So, to him, it was worth the risk. And I would suggest to you that if we knew what was to come for those who chose him, that we would definitely say, yes, Lord. Which is what we should always say anyway. In humility. Okay. 
So he chose us before the foundation of the world. And we are a first fruit. So again, go to the right. We go past Colossians to 1 Thessalonians and then to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, where um, we are exhorted, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So the Holy Spirit's working in you to sanctify you and the belief in the truth, all that is worked together in your salvation. And that is because he chose you. Uh, and you are to be a first fruits. And there's a lot to unpack there that we won't right now, but bottom line is a first fruits is a promise of more fruit to come. Okay? So he chose you. He chose you his people, the church. Now, the, the word chosen is also used, so that was kind of chose, but now I'm looking at chosen. So go back to the left a little bit. Colossians <clears throat> chapter 3, verse 12. A beautiful verse. Like that whole section there. Be there? Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love. So here's an exhortation that as God's chosen ones, that there's a certain uh, life that you're to live. These characteristics, these qualities should come from your, your lives as his chosen ones. Why? Because that's his character. We, are, as his chosen ones, are to reflect God's character. And we are holy. We have set apart, what that means. And we are beloved. So as his chosen ones, he loves you. That's incredible to think that the Almighty God, who set everything in motion, who sees it all, knows it all, knows your flaws, he loves you. And he chose you. Um, and he encourages you to put on a compassionate heart, which is what he has uh, as well. Okay. 1 Thessalonians 1 4. So we go back, we're going back to the right again. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 4. Oops, I went too far. Okay, so St. Paul's giving thanks for these uh, Thessalonians. Then he says, verse 4, For we know, brothers, and of course, and sisters, loved by God, again, that emphasis, that you're loved by God, that he has chosen you. We know this, that he's chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. We know that you are chosen because you've responded. We don't know anybody else whether they're chosen or not. Because as long as they have breath, they could end up choosing the Lord, responding to his choice of them. Are you hearing me? <clears throat> so we have no place to stand in condemnation. It's not our role. Our role is actually to pray for those persons right to the very end. Um, that they would be the chosen of God as well. And you remember the thief on the cross, remember? I mean, that was his last thing was to confess, you know, remember me when you enter your kingdom, Lord. But one of my favorite things there, this guy had no opportunity to do anything right. He was about to die. And he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, what? Today, you will be with me in paradise. He was a chosen one. Wow, this scoundrel, <laughs> right? I mean, bad enough to be crucified. Wow. Okay, that's, that's amazing grace, folks. That's what preaches here, right? Uh, but it's God's doing. It's his compassionate heart. And we don't understand all the whys and the wherefores and all that, but what we see and hear is that he loves 
and he's gone to the cross so that we could be with him. All right, further to the right, St. James Epistle. This is chapter 2, verse 5. <clears throat> Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him, but to be heirs of the kingdom? He's promised those who love him. So again, this kind of fits a little bit what Paul was saying in Corinthians about choosing the weak, choosing the ones who aren't famous, choosing the ones who aren't uh, noble. I mean, he chooses some of them too, but he chooses the regular kind of folk. Um, and of course, I think, oh, I don't know, I won't speculate on all that as purposes, um, but it just shows his grace, and he's not impressed uh, by the same things that the world is impressed by. <clears throat> okay, so there's choice. Further to the right, next book, 1 Peter 2. This is a great text. Verse 9, but you are a chosen race. Boy, that sounds like what he could be talking about Israel. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Hear that? I mean, doesn't that ring like, I mean, here you, you have this equation, really. The same things he said to Israel. You are my treasured possession. You're a holy nation. You're, you know, a, a priesthood. We covered this last week. Uh, you, you know, they were created for, for that. He says about the church. That you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The Gentiles were in darkness but he's called them out into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, you were a mishmash all over. <laughs> but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And on he goes. Isn't that a great picture? So you've been made into a holy nation, a royal priesthood. You are a chosen race unto him. Okay. Okay. Finally, let's go to the final book. Yes, don't shake and tremble. <laughs> All right, chapter 17. It's talking about the beast, the Antichrist. Um, and talking about how they will uh, the, the beast and the kingdoms will make war, this is verse 14, make war on the lamb and the lamb will conquer them. The lamb being who? Jesus, okay? Who is also the lion, <laughs> the lion of Judah, okay? So, and the lamb will conquer them for he is, what? Lord of lords and king of kings. And those with him are called and chosen and faithful. Uh, his people will be coming back with him, and they are the called, the chosen, and the faithful. Amen. Okay, so right to the end of the book. So the church is, cho is, is chosen, and they are the elect. So let's look at that word, see if we can do that a little more quickly. Mark, you know the gospel of Mark, Matthew, Mark, chapter 13. Jesus is talking about the last days in um, chapter 13 here. Let's see, 13 verses um, 20 and following. Oops, that's my problem, I was in 14. Okay. <clears throat> and if the Lord, this is Jesus talking, and if the Lord had not cut off, cut the short, short the days, no human being would be saved. By the way, when we get into the fall, Lord willing, I'll be covering this stuff. This is the, the very end. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, okay, that just makes it very clear, election and chosen go together. He shortened the days. This is talking about the, the very end, the persecution is going to be such so bad, stuff going on. The Lord somehow is shortening the days there, and I don't know exactly how that fleshes out, 
But the point is, he's having mercy on the elect, on the chosen. And then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or look, there's what he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. So it's going to be so bad that if it were possible, the elect. What's that saying there? It's going to be really bad. The typical person would be deceived. There's a coming deception on the world. And I believe we're seeing that emerge even now. Uh, we are in an age of deceit. and We ain't seen nothing yet. Um, so, and then it says, if it were possible, the elect would be deceived. But why is it not possible for the elect to be deceived? Because they're elect. They belong to him. Okay? That should be comforting. Very comforting. Okay. Um, Romans 8, 33. Great chapter, right? Um, <clears throat> so he's talking about God's everlasting love, who can separate us from God, who, verse 33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Sorry, they belong to me. I've covered them. There's no charge you can bring against them. Isn't that cool? All right. No charge. Okay, Titus chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to go more quickly here. <clears throat> Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, and on he goes. God's elect. Um, basically, he's serving God's elect. That's what you know, his purpose is. Uh, that's us. Of course, we're served to this day. And then finally, 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. He's writing his epistle, and he says, uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, okay, who are scattered. This is to the elect. So this emphasize, emphasis in the New Testament. And what does that do for us? Well, it should, it should enable us to feel secure in the Lord. So if you turn with me to the Gospel of John 10, we'll finish with the Gospel of John, chapter 10. This is the chapter of the Good Shepherd. I am the Good Shepherd. And we'll break down here, verse 2 of chapter 10. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So he's talking really about himself. He can come in straight through the door. He's got the qualifications as the shepherd. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He calls them, and he calls them by name, and he leads them out. So this is what he's talking about, the role of the shepherd. Okay, so called, chosen, elect, those go together. Um, <clears throat> verse 9. I am the door. So now he's using... Another description, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. If anyone enters by me. Verse 11, so his sheep, this is what qualifies you as a sheep, that you've entered through Jesus, okay? So if you've entered through Jesus, you're his sheep. And he laid down his life for the sheep, which of course is the blood of the covenant. Verse 11, right? We talked about in the covenant, there's the shedding of blood. He's the lamb who was slain and he was, he's the lamb who was slain for the sake of his sheep. And they are his own. So verse 14, he says, I am the good shepherd, I know my own, and my own know me. There's that possessiveness. We belong to him. So that has great ramifications for our security. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So there's a connection here between the sheep and the shepherd that's like there is between the son and the father. And those are inseparable, aren't they? The father and the son will not be separated from each other. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. Which of course, here in that case is referring, I believe, to Gentiles. Okay? There's, there's others. He's talking to the Jews, but he says, I've got other sheep that are not of this fold, and I'm going to bring them also. They'll listen to me, and there'll be one flock and one shepherd. By the way, uh, <clears throat> there's one people of God. 
But there's two in the one. There's redeemed Israel, and there's the redeemed church. Okay? This should not be a surprise to us. In marriage, there's one that are two. Two that are one. You following? In the Godhead, there's the three and one. There's compound unities in Scripture. Okay? This is a compound unity. So there's two folds, one um, flock. The way you can say, I've got another fold. You're one fold. There's another fold. No, one flock, one shepherd. As I bring them the folds together. Verse 27. Uh, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. Who gives them eternal life? He does. And they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Okay, are we talking security here? We are, aren't we? And you know who the no one includes? This was the one I wrestled with. Me. I can't snatch myself out of his hand either. That's often our concern. Well, I do it. Not if I've come and belong to him. My father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. Okay? Powerful passage of security. And in the New Testament, actually, excuse me, in Scripture, there are 400 plus verses that in some way or another point to uh, security. And the security is based on what? The promises and, and work of God. Covenant. So it goes right back to that. It's based on his covenant with his people. Okay? So, and if God doesn't keep his promises to Abraham and his seed, can we be assured that he will keep his promises to us? Hmm. So one of these two things has to give, logically. I would say that the emphasis of Scripture is clearly that he's keeping his promises to Israel as well. All right? The Abrahamic, the land, the Davidic, and new covenants are all based on the promise of God. The new covenant replaces the one conditional covenant which Israel broke. That was the Mosaic. For in the land. So God's promises to Abraham and his seed are unconditional, secure because they are based on his power and faithfulness. And I'll close with one of my favorite verses. 2 Timothy. It's found 2.13, I believe it is. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. He who will come again will have on his stole, on his robe, faithful and true. That's our Lord who's coming again for us. So we are secure. Now, next time, what we'll end up doing is just briefly visiting the fact, yeah, um, there's a reason we have to talk about the restoration of Israel because she got herself into big-time trouble. There was judgment upon her uh, more than once, and exiled more than once. So we're going to examine that together as then we look to the texts that emphasize his promise to restore Israel and Judah. Okay? Um, so we're getting close to, I think what we'll do after a couple few weeks, we'll take a, a break on this for the summer. We'll have something else to feed you, though. And then in the fall, I'll resume with um, the end of the age material, <laughs> which is tied in, of course, with his purposes with Israel. But I wanted you to see <clears throat> that he's got promises for her. She is critical for the future, for the latter days, as well. I'll establish, I hope, for you. And um, because the, the Israel to, of today is not the Israel that God is looking to accomplish, okay? I think it's, it's in, in included here. I mean, clearly, what the Lord is doing, I mean, it's part of that process. We'll look at that as we look at Ezekiel and some other things. All right, uh, we've got more fun to come. Um, 
It'll be stimulating, that's for sure. So pray for me that I can put controversial things together uh, in a way that uh, is faithful. Oh, I like that. Faithful and true. May it be so. The Lord be with you. Lord, we thank you for your amazing grace. It permeates the whole book, Lord. And we see that you choose, not because we deserve it, but because you are love, because you are gracious. And Lord, your ways are are way beyond us. But we thank you that you've revealed us to us that you are a God who loves us so much that you'd come into the world and die on the cross for us. How could anyone question then that love when it's that great? And so, Lord, we trust you. We thank you that our, because you say so, our salvation for those of us who've entered by the door that Jesus is, that our destiny is secure. So, Lord, we ask you to help us to live with that boldness in these challenging days as we look to the fulfillment of your promise to come again and to make all things new. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen.